bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again just for another day to be alive and have the chance to live for you and bring you glory with this life you've given us. We thank you so much for the gift of eternal life that you promised to those who trust in your Son. Help us to never take this for granted, Father, and every day we live, we live in hope because of you and because of what he accomplished on the cross. Father, we ask that you bless those in our congregation that are right now ill and suffering and struggling. We ask that you comfort them in a unique way as only you can do. And we also ask that you bring them back to the fold here so that we can fellowship together in the word and in your spirit. Father, we ask that you bless this message today, have your Holy Spirit guide us and teach us and have us learn what you have predetermined for us today to understand. We ask these things in the name of our precious Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, and by the power of your spirit, we pray. All right, special India mission report today, along with a discussion about the visible results of saving faith. So first of all, I want to give special thanks to Pastor Collins for letting me share the good news with you all today. Um, I was thinking it's like sharing the good news about the good news, in a way, uh, from what happened out there in India. I've been honored to serve the Lord in evangelism and missionary work through Christ Saves Ministries since 2005. And on the board, you can see our basic information if you want to um, learn more about that or contact us about anything you hear today. And just to be clear, uh, Christ Saves Ministries is a separate ministry from North Christian Church and is also supported by others outside of this church. So just so you know, you know where we're coming from and you'll learn more about what we've been doing as most of you know, uh, Michael and I just returned from two weeks in India, and I'll attempt to share with you in 15 minutes what we experienced and what we're very excited about going forward. And there's more information available upon request, of course. So despite stomach problems and mosquito challenges, which are really superficial in the big picture, we had a wonderful time of spiritual victories and good work done on behalf of our Lord in India. And this was our fifth time to India over the years uh, with Pastor Adams as our point man and guide. So here's a picture of Pastor Adams on the right praying before a, a Bible class at one of the Bible schools we teach at. And Michael and I are seated there. So this man's good work was evident to us once again, highlighted by seeing his 30 orphans living with them in his 200 square foot home. I'll just repeat that in case you think I misspoke. 30 orphans he has living with them, with his family in his 200 square foot home. If you don't know what that is, look it up and measure it out. Also, he has 50 Bible students that meet on the roof of his home several times per week. So some days they feed about 100 people a day in that home. On the board here, you can see uh, this is a sign that's on the front of his home. And this is for the orphanage in particular. They call it Grace of God's Children's Home. But instead of showing you a picture of the orphans, I'm going to show you a brief video of them uh, singing. And this uh, gives, does a little more justice to what's going on there.
So as you can see, it's pretty uh, moving what he's doing there. Um, there were even more than 30 there. Some kids were visiting when they heard we were coming. But they live right there in that room. They eat, sleep, share everything together. And one thing about the Indian people is they know how to maximize space, as you can already tell. Uh, they don't care about their personal space. In fact, they're used to living elbow to elbow with each other, and they are able to do so in the love of Christ. Not perfectly, but pretty amazing. It's funny that our first lesson to review with you today, before I jump ahead there, is on the visible results of saving faith. And that's exactly what you see when you go there and visit with these people. The greatest evidence is love, as we know. And God's love is sacrificial in nature. It's not the worldly love. It's sacrificial in nature. And that's what you see when you go there. And this was Michael's first time in India, and he was blown away by what he witnessed, particularly by the commitment in the lives of our four pastors that we sponsor. Uh, they are sold out for the gospel of our Lord, putting their own lives aside, like totally, to reach the lost with the gospel as well. So their names again are Pastor Adams, uh, Pastor Raja, Joshua, and Babu. Uh, we had some time with all of them, and all four of them continue to live out the Great Commission. And what's amazing is they're not just pastors. In fact, Babu's an evangelist, not a pastor. But they're not just pastors with the intent of teaching their people and ignoring the Great Commission. They, the very vital part of their ministry is going out to the most remote villages they can find. Driving, walking, dirt roads, dirt paths, and coming out in the middle of nowhere where there's a thousand people that live in the slums. That's their intent. That's their objective, their primary objective. Um, so it's been beautiful to watch. Over the last eight or ten years, we've seen them do these activities and live this way. So on the board, um, here you see Pastor Raja and Babu uh, praying with Michael and I before one of the Bible classes again, just so you can see what they look like. We also just had another 50,000 salvation tracts printed, which Pastor Adams divides among the four of them. And typically, they get out 50,000 salvation tracts throughout Hindu villages over a six-month period. That's typical. It's been happening for years. And we also had the chance to participate with them in, in what they call village gospel, which is going out to these remote locations, these poor difficult locations to uh, see, as Michael will tell you. And we got the chance to do what they do, which again is called uh, village gospel in their terms. And you can see there I am standing with a, a bunch of the salvation tracks in hand, and Michael's there with Pastor Adams and a few kids there on the bottom of the screen. Kids follow us around everywhere. It's kind of fun. But um, they're open. And uh, we get the chance to tell them about Jesus. And some of them never heard of him. Never heard of him. So this is the, the raw good work that's being done out there by these guys uh, every day, pretty much. And the financial and health problems that these pe people have are so many, um, not just because, not, not that they can't be solved, that they don't have the means to solve them as easily as we would. Certain health issues we can go take care of that they don't. Financial solutions that they don't have to fix things. So it really is just super humbling and also a privilege to pray for many of them as they asked us to pray for them and give them hope in Christ's name. Uh, this was after a Sunday service in one of the villages and after the teaching they all come up, they kind of line up and they ask for prayers uh, one at a time for their different problems. So we probably prayed for over a hundred people throughout the two weeks of events. Our activities included three main types of activities, uh, teaching at Bible schools during the day, village gospel in the late afternoons in the slums, and some small crusade events at night. And by God's grace, we had the chance to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with hundreds of people, as well as teaching the word of God to many eager believers. Here's a picture of one of the crusades. Uh, this is from the stage. Uh, you can see Michael there with his flowers on. He loved his flowers. They give you these fresh flowers. They're amazing, amazing, fresh, beautiful-smelling flowers. 
And uh, there's Pastor Adams on the stage with the table, and hopefully you can see all the people seated on the ground. Uh, they put some mats or carpets down, and they sit Indian style, go figure. Can't really see them, but there's about 100 people there on the right side. And when teaching, the subject and the approach varied depending on the audience. Um, this is something that, you know, the Spirit's kind of, I guess, led me to do over the years. Well, I'll prepare maybe 10 different lessons and then, you know, leave it open to what, what he puts on me to emphasize. And we'll be sharing this week the few lessons that he really emphasized, that he really had us teach over and over to many different groups that we came to. So the big challenge in what we do is finding people in other countries whose hearts are sold out for the Lord. That's the big challenge. That's for, like if we look at our role as supporters of people that are on the ground every day and the people that are willing to go out in these, you know, I don't want to say God forsaken, but these tough, difficult places uh, where there's also opposition. There's people that have never heard his name or people fighting for their own religion as the Hindus might sometimes do. Um, to find people sold out for the Lord and his will is to seek and save the lost in Luke 19, 10. And my belief is that these men of God uh, the four that we support, are these types, which I've seen over and over and over now. And this was reaffirmed by Michael's eyewitness. And we'd like to go forward with them as never before, taking it to the next level in the things we support. So we have some wonderful things in mind that will advance the gospel at a rapid pace before our Lord's return. Um, just as a side note, I really do think we're in the middle of a great revival right now throughout the world. And we don't see it as we stay in our own little cocoon in America and we think this is life. This isn't real life. We're, we're the abnormal, not the normal. And we think that there's not a revival happening because of negativity in our country. But I'll tell you, after doing some research, there are tens of thousands of missionaries out there right now in North Africa and Asia. Native missionaries, not Western missionaries like us. Tens of thousands that I know of that are supported financially to full-time spread the gospel. That's what's going on right now. That doesn't include Western missionaries. Who knows how many thousands this year will go to India from America. But we stay in our little bubble and we think we don't look at the big picture. But I think this is happening. I think this is the end times and one of the signs of the end times. But again, what stood out on this trip is the outstanding quality of the men of God that we've been blessed to work with. It's a privilege to work with these guys when you see the way they have. They don't have a life of their own. Literally, their whole life is doing God's work in one area or another. But God assigns each of, each of us a task. What's our task? It, you know, it very well might be to be the support line, the uh, logistical support for the frontline troops. That's what seems pretty obvious to me. And these men are spreading the gospel as the number one priority, to get people saved before the Lord comes back. And that's why as part of their Bible school training, which we support six Bible schools out there with an average of 30 or 40 students in each one, as part of their Bible school training, they take the students out a couple times a week to the villages to pass out tracts and share the gospel. What pastor would call OJT, on-the-job training. Honestly, probably no better way to learn and we should learn from them. But that's what they do as part of the Bible school. That's what this is all about. Why are we here learning? That's what this is all about, right? To get equipped, to get knowledge, to understand the things of the Lord and the ways of the Lord, and then go out and actually do it. So the great purpose of the Great Commission hasn't been lost by them, as it is with many churches in America. And it all begins with good training in the Word, and they use many of our lessons that we provide on the fullness of the gospel, like the ones you're going to hear this week. Here's a picture of Pastor Adams' Bible school on the roof of his home. Uh, they put up, as you can see, kind of these wooden poles and these, these tarps, if you will, to keep the sun off. But there's about 50 students there that day. One of the things we're most excited about going forward is a program to sponsor the graduates of these schools as evangelists and missionaries. 
we can sponsor an evangelist or a pastor for only $25 a month. And our leaders will choose the most dedicated graduates that they think they have. And by the way, we already have hundreds of graduates over the last seven or eight years that are already out there in the villages. But the problem is they can't do it full time, a lot of them, because they're trying to feed their family. And $25 a month will feed the family, believe it or not. Most of them have a great desire to not only spread the gospel in remote Hindu villages, but also they plant churches there. And they go back and they teach and they bring up the new sheep in the word of God. So please pray about your participation with us. Ask the Spirit how he wants you to be involved. The time is short, I believe. Uh, We're so confident that these men are frontline carriers of the gospel. So I hope that you at least join us in prayer as we put our own lives aside and as they've been doing as an example to us and help us help them do things that have been on their heart for a long time to God's glory. We will have a full slideshow available on the website in the near future. You can also watch a few uh, short video clips of the 30 orphans that we showed uh, currently on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and do a search for Christ Saves Ministries, you'll see a channel with my name on it, and you'll have to click on that. Uh, You'll see a few different videos. I'm going to upload a few more as well. And as I close out this segment, here are some of the top priorities that we would like to help with going forward. And please remember, if you'd like to participate, remember you should never compromise your giving to your church first. This is our home base. This is where we learn and we, we, we uh, keep healthy spiritual lives, of course. So don't lose sight that this is your top priority. But these are some of the ministry needs for Christ Saves Ministries going forward. We need gospel bands for the India pastors. About 7,500 will buy a good used SUV for three of our pastors. Uh, We already had $7,500 donated by one family for a van for Pastor Adam, so thank you for that. Um, And by the way, when they they use an SUV, they use an SUV. They fit probably 14 people in, in the SUV, not seven like we would max out. So they don't have to take buses anymore to the villages. They don't have to walk miles to the villages anymore. They actually have something that can take them there more frequently Uh, more safely and more people at the same time. We also need about 315 total Telugu Bibles requested by our four pastors for the Hindu converts throughout the areas that they've been visiting. Uh, There's quite a few of them, and they don't have money to buy their own Bibles. Only costs about $3 each at the Bible Society in Hyderabad. So that's where we want to buy them. If you want to contribute to that, please let us know. And then our sponsoring program going forward, uh, you can sponsor an evangelist or a missionary for $25 a month. It helps one of our graduates feed his family to do gospel work full time, which is their desire. And their name, photo, and testimony will be provided to you if you're a sponsor uh, so that you can see who you're sponsoring and also keep them in daily prayer. And so far we have four of these evangelists sponsored. Uh, Also, you can sponsor an orphan for only $10 a month per orphan. And I know that seems low, but Pastor Adams already has the setup going, smooth machine running. And uh, that's about how much he said it would cost to bring more orphans in. And he says he has room for another 15. And they're already waiting to get in because they know, the neighborhood knows about him and what he's been doing now for years. So we'd like to help him. He wants to take another 15 in, but we do need sponsors to support basically the food costs. And um, name and photo will be provided also of orphans for daily prayer. And if you want to sponsor a widow, that's about $20 a month per widow. We still have seven widows out of the 10 that we'd like to uh, sponsor that need it. And we'll also provide a name and photo there as well. So we have a chance to make a difference in people's lives and help save some souls. And we're blessed with men of God that we can be so confident in that they're doing the real deal. There's just no deceit. There's no compromise in their lives. Um, It really is just overwhelming. So let's help them live in their callings, their great desire to fulfill the Great Commission. They're very eager, caring for orphans and widows along the way. And what I think will also happen when we sponsor an evangelist or a missionary, one reason they don't take orphans in themselves is because they can't even feed their own families right now. 
But if we help them feed their families and not have worries in that area, I believe they have a heart to take in one or two orphans in their own homes, all of them. That's just how I see how they think and how they live. And Pastor Adams has been a great example for all of his students in that area as well. So it could be a wonderful, beautiful snowball effect, so to speak, from the good work being done. Again, uh, here's our contact information, our website, and email if you'd like to get our monthly newsletter, let me know. And I want to thank you for your prayers and support. And I pray that this report changes your perspective on your life in America and your purpose in the big picture of the Great Commission. I mean, what are we here for? What are we living for? How stupid to live for ourselves when we're going to see him in about two seconds for all eternity. So some of us need to wake up. No doubt about that. The Lord may be coming back soon for his bride. And I hope that we're all found with our chins up doing his work and eagerly awaiting his return. On the board regarding the signs of the times, Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, but when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. May we not be found asleep when he comes back, living for ourselves in some dream world. May we take this to heart because this is our ultimate purpose, the best way we can serve him in the Great Commission. Amen? All right. So now we're going to transition to our lesson for today, which was one of the main topics presented at the Bible schools, um, the three different Bible schools that we did visit, and that is the visible results of saving faith. In past classes, uh, weekly on Pal Talk, I have the chance to teach the Bible schools in India, you know, over the internet with translation, and we've taught in detail about what we would call the invisible results of saving faith such as redemption, justification, positional sanctification, those pillars of our salvation. And the timing was perfect when we went to India to now transition to the visible results of saving faith, face to face with the students who were very happy to see us after just hearing a voice on the computer. So on the board, the visible results of saving faith, the wonderful results of saving faith include the visible miracles, let's call them, that occur in the lives of believers, changed lives that are totally the work of God's grace. If you're a believer, you know there are certain things about you that have changed over the years. Your attitude toward certain things, uh, the way you treat certain people, even your attitude toward the Word of God. And these are things that become visible signs in our lives as indications of the new heart given to us by the Lord when we first believed. The Lord said we would know true believers and pretenders by their fruit. Just as we can tell if a tree is good by its fruit. How else can you tell if the roots of a tree are bad or sick? How else can you tell unless you look at the fruit? So on the board, this is what we taught the students. We cannot see the roots of a tree of faith, just as we can't see someone's heart. But we can see the fruit of a tree of faith, which are the visible results or proofs in a believer's life, proof of their faith. The fruit reveals if the roots of the tree are good or not. That's how God designed life. The fruit reveals if the roots of the tree are good or not. The visible results of saving faith are signs that a person has surrendered in faith to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When someone honestly does that thing, God steps in and changes their heart. Again on the board, we cannot see the roots of a tree of faith just as we can't see a person's heart. But we can see the fruit of a tree of faith which are the visible results and proofs in a believer's life. The Bible tells us there are certain characteristics that are found in the life of a believer. It tells us, like 
we've seen this a few years ago. Hopefully you recognize this title from a few years ago that we taught here at the church. The visible results of saving faith. The, these are things that accompany saving faith. They accompany saving faith. They're almost a part of it. They're inseparable according to the word of God. And the first visible result that we talked about in depth in the Bible school was that the believer has fear of the Lord. Psalm 103, 8 through 18. Psalm 119, 120 and 161. Malachi 3, 16 through 18. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. Isaiah 50, verse 10. Luke 18, 14. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Ephesians 5, 21. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Just to name a few. The believer has fear of the Lord. That's what the Bible tells us. Proper fear of the Lord goes hand in hand with the repentant heart of a believer. If someone comes to a point where they get on their knees in their soul and they repent towards God about their sin and they say, Lord, save me. I know I'm nothing. I'm a jerk. I'm a blank, fill in the blank. Um, that point of surrender and turning to Christ to be saved. Well, fear of the Lord goes right, right along with that attitude. It's even granted by God, we might say, because repentance is granted by God. So first off, turn in your Bibles. We'll see some of these scriptures. Go to Psalm 103, verse 11. Psalm 103, verse 11. Again, one of the major signs of saving faith is that a believer has fear of the Lord. In other words, these things aren't nice-to-haves. These things aren't things to have when, when, you know, you're following God the right way, so to speak, when you have good days only or something like that. Like, this isn't for some believers. It's for all believers. It comes with saving faith. Psalm 103.11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame, he is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on who? On those who fear the Lord. It doesn't say on believers, which we might think it would, but it says those who fear the Lord have God's grace forever and ever and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them, as we've been seeing from the pulpit. Those who remember to do his precepts are described here as those who have his grace forever and ever. Hmm. Maybe, just maybe, that's a description of a believer. On the board, as we've seen from this pulpit multiple times, man is only saved by grace, as we know in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace through faith. And God only gives grace to the humble. For example, those who fear him. James 4, 6, but also Luke 18, 14. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 18, 14. Or actually, Luke 18, verse 9. <clears throat> this actually goes hand in hand with salvation. God giving grace to the humble. It's not just for believers only but for those who turn to him at the moment of salvation. He gives them the grace of saving faith. Again, on the board, man is only saved by his grace, and God only gives grace to the humble, for example, those who fear him. Look at Luke 18, four, uh, verse 9. And he also, Jesus, told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, 
one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. That sounds like fear of God to me. He was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified. It is one of the invisible results of saving faith. This man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. God gives grace to the humble, the one willing to humble himself before the Lord. When God sees a person's humility, including fear for him or of him, and they turn to Christ, he saves them by grace. He gives grace to the humble. He exalts the humble. Turn your Bibles to Matthew, I'm sorry, Malachi, chapter 3, verse 16. The last book in the Old Testament, Malachi 3, 16. Again, our point right now is that the believer has fear of the Lord. That's what the Bible plainly says as a description of someone who believes. Malachi 3.16 Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. I hope you see there on the board, do you see how fear of the Lord along with serving God, are described as characteristics of the saved? And the alternative is to be one of the wicked? Malachi 3, 16 through 18. That's what I see. And this does not mean that we must earn our salvation. May it never be. But we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. Amen. Thank God. But what it does mean on the board is that those who honestly turn to Christ will manifest a certain type of life because God changes their heart. If you read that passage again, you'll see it again. The ones who are saved, the ones that are his own possession, are those that fear him. That's a believer. These are evidences of saving faith or results of saving faith that are inevitable, that accompany saving faith. Again, the point on the board, those who honestly turn to Christ will manifest a certain type of life because God changes their heart. They actually appreciate, they appreciate God. So if you see someone that says they're a believer and they don't appreciate God, and you could tell by their life, they really could care less then there's a chance that they're not converted, that God hasn't changed their heart. Because there's no thankfulness. Like, if you're a believer, doesn't that mean you're very thankful that he saved you? So if there's no thankfulness, what does that tell you? And even though there are growth stages in a believer's life, notice in this passage how plainly fear of the Lord is stated as a sign of salvation. As in verse 17 The Lord will spare the ones who fear and serve him, and he'll make them his own possession. That's what true believers look like. And this is what we're getting across to the Bible students. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith, and that's it, not by works, so that no man can boast. 
But be rest assured, this is what a true believer looks like. How do you tell the true from the false? That's what Jesus would say in Matthew 7. How do you tell one of your own, one of his own, versus a pretender? This is one of the ways. This is what true believers look like. Just because believers are under grace, that doesn't take away the reality of proper fear and reverence for God in the heart of his children. In fact, that's what receiving God's grace produces in a person. On the board, Isaiah 50, verse 10 in the NIV. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like salvation? Let him who walks in the dark and has no light trust in the name of the Lord. And what what accompanies that? Fearing the Lord. That's like the attitude of repentance. It's there in a person who's ready to trust the Lord to be saved. And they realize they're nothing before their almighty God and creator. If you read Isaiah chapter 50, it's largely about prophecies of those who would attack the Messiah and reject him. But the way of escape, the way to escape the darkness, is to fear the Lord and trust in Him for the light of life. It says it pretty plainly. And the fear of the Lord will be a continued lifestyle for the believer, just like repentance is, because the believer has been changed. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 7 1. See, these are some of the things that our four pastors in India are humble enough to receive from us. They actually crave lessons from us. They, they email me quite often, you know, what, what, what further lessons do you have that we can share? They use the lessons we've already given them, like, like this one, as part of the training of all these Bible students. So when they graduate in two or three years from the course that they provide, they're prepared in the gospel. They're prepared in, in salvation and how to spread the gospel. And then they go out and do it. Go figure. Reading the Bibles every day. By the way, that's one thing they do out there. Normal to them. They read the Bibles every single day. It's like their food. It's their, it's their, their life, their energy. So, um, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, right? Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. As the believer continues in God's plan, one way to mature in holiness is having fear of God. So it's present at salvation because it accompanies saving faith. It's the attitude that God even gives someone. But it's present in someone's life through maturity. It's a a quality that helps keep us humble, for example, and helps us grow and learn and lets God change us. Part of the process of sanctification is having proper fear of God. Some of you might be saying, well, if I'm a believer, why should I fear God anymore? Well, the Bible tells us to. What are you going to do with that verse? And these other ones that we're going to. It's a good thing to have fear of God. It's a proper thing. It's like, it's like how can you not have fear of God? If you saw him right now and he showed his face to you, what do you think, what do you think you'd be? Do you think you'd have any over, being overwhelmed by his power and his majesty? We'll talk about that in a minute. On the board, the Greek word for fear is phobos, meaning fear terror, and reverence. We just read 2 Corinthians 7, 1, and we see the same word used in Ephesians 5, 21. So we all got to ask ourselves, do we have this type of reverence, this type of healthy fear of God because he created the heavens and the earth? When's the last time we went out and looked up in the sky and observed the creation and said, he created this with his breath. So what's going to happen if you see that one? Go to Ephesians 5.21. Ephesians 5.21. 
I was thinking about how Jesus is called the Lion of Judah. What would be your reaction if you came face to face with a lion? Standing 10 feet from you. (laughs) Right? You might have to go use the bathroom real quick. So that's a picture of, a small picture of, the might and the power of God. That is irrefutable. And faith, saving faith, comes with this thing. Like, whoa, I am subject to him, the creator of heaven and earth. And even as believers, we continue on in the fear of God. Ephesians 5.21. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Huh. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This is the Greek word phobos again. Probably more appropriately translated reverence here. A reverence and an awe of Christ should lead you to serve one another. Because he did that for you. So on the board, reverence bows down in awe. It does not take God lightly or get too casually familiar with him, like many of us Americans do. Reverence includes a healthy fear which accompanied all those who ever saw God in the Bible. This attitude will be present in the heart of true believers. Think of all the Old Testament and New Testament believers that saw God in some way, or they saw the angel of the Lord. What did they all do? They fell flat on their faces in fear and awe of him. They could not remain standing. That's the type of reverence God wants us to have for him. In other words, you're going to see me one day real soon. You, you should live like and honor me like the Lord that I am. Don't forget who I am. Obey my commands. Right? Love one another. And the reason we do that is Ephesians 5.21. We have reverence for Christ, so we love one another. So in other words, this word for uh, fear, the fear of Christ or the fear of God, is not just like the word respect as we know it. It's a lot more than that. So again, the point on the board, reverence bows down in awe. It does not take God lightly or get too casually familiar with him. Reverence includes a healthy fear which accompanied all those who ever saw God. This attitude will be present in the hearts of true believers. That's what we're reading. Turn to Philippians 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, 12. And I hope you're all wondering, too, why God is teaching us this type of subject over and over. Like some of you might be like, I remember this, or I heard this before. Um, We're about to talk about obedience, for example, as another sign of saving faith. And as you know, we've just been on obedience for the last, what, three months from the pulpit in some way, shape, or form. Why is God repeating himself to you? You who think you have it all figured out, right? Why is God repeating himself to us in different ways? Apparently this is super important. Or we're missing something. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This passage, my friends, is addressed to believers. In verse 12, it says, my beloved. But this does not mean to work for your salvation, but to work it out or participate in bringing it to completion in your life. As we saw in 2 Corinthians 7, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And in verse 13, We're reminded that God is the one at work in you to complete his purpose for you. So here we see an appropriate fear the believer has for his almighty God. A deep reverence, even. Knowing that his very creator is working out his plan in his life. On the board, what the Spirit has been revealing to us is the seamlessness between genuine faith and an obedient lifestyle. 
I hope you see this too. Over the last four years, we could say, he's been teaching us the seamlessness between genuine faith and an obedient lifestyle. The scriptures teach these two things will agree overall as a lifestyle in the believer's life, despite the sin that creeps into our lives from time to time and gets us off track. That still happens. But the, genu- the general lifestyle of a believer is this, because he's been changed by God. And in fact, another visible result of saving faith in the lives of true believers is obedience. Romans 1.5, Romans 16, 25-27, John 3.36, 2 Corinthians 9.13, and 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2 just to name a few. Another visible result in the life of a true believer is obedience, at least to some degree. If it's missing, something's wrong. If you don't see any obedience to the Lord in a person who claims to believe, you might rightly wonder about his faith. And we can't see the entire lives of other people, so we're not to judge either. But we certainly can pray for them and ask God for an opportunity with them if he deems it necessary. For example, on the board, Romans 1.5 in the NIV. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles. And remember, Gentiles refers to unbelievers. To call all the unbelievers to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. So apparently, very plainly stated, there is an obedience that comes from true faith. Notice we're not talking about perfection or sinlessness. Every believer is going to sin and fail at times, like Paul talked about in Romans 7, his struggle. And the Corinthians revealed to us over and over that even though they had been sanctified, we see all their failures in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 even. So we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about a lifestyle, and we're talking about an inescapable change that takes place in the heart of a true believer because the Bible says God changes their heart. And the believer will have a desire in his heart to obey God. Another example of this same phrase is in Romans 16, 26, part B in the NIV, so that all the Gentiles, again, unbelievers, might come to the obedience that comes from faith. Again, faith apparently produces some type of obedience. So on the board, obedience accompanies true saving faith because surrender to Jesus as Lord, not just Savior, is involved. There's a lot of people, we've talked about this, right, the last few years, a lot of people out there that will keep Jesus on the side just in case. And they say, okay, I'll take him as my Savior, but I'm going to be my own Lord. I'm going to live the way I want to live. You know, I'm glad the Bible says what it says. I got him on the side when I need him. And, you know, the Bible says (laughs) in like a verse we always quote, right? Acts 16, 31. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. It doesn't say believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. You have to believe in him as Lord to be saved. That's part of the deal. That's part of who he is. Otherwise, you might be believing in another Jesus. As I think it's um, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about. Another Jesus, another gospel. So the fact is a true believer, you end up seeing some type of obedience in his life because he surrendered to Jesus as Lord, not just Savior. Turn to 2 Corinthians 9, 13. I get really sad when I see people that um, they might claim to be a believer, but their whole life is about living for themselves and living in sin, like without any conscience clash. And I get really sad because I'm like, oh, they might be fooling themselves. Like their whole life is that and not at all trying to follow him in any way. 2 Corinthians 9.13 Because of the proof given by this ministry, know there is proof, notice there is proof of 
saving faith. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. Notice it says, they'll glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ. On the board, look at the NIV's version. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. I like that translation a little bit better. It accompanies it. If you say you're a believer and you are a believer, it's going to accompany it, a certain level of obedience. And notice in this verse how it's tied to the gospel itself. So on the board, the true believer cannot help but obey God and his righteousness, at least to some degree in his life. Why? Because he's a new creature. Because God put Jesus, God put the spirit of Jesus in you permanently. That's what the Bible says you have if you're a believer. How is it possible to not be changed? You're a new creature in Christ if you're a believer. So it's inescapable that the believer's heart has been changed by the Spirit of the Lord. He cannot help but have some fear of God if he's a genuine believer because that's what faith produces. On the board... Again, we know faith is a gift from God, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Faith is a gift from God. And all perfect gifts are from the Father of lights above. James 1, 17. Therefore, if faith is a gift from God, it must produce goodness in the lives of those it's given to. It has to because it's a perfect gift from the Father above. Amen? It has to. It's the same with true repentance, which is the other sign of the coin of saving faith. It's a gift from God, and it does not come back empty. This is part of the good news, folks. You know what, know what the good news is? That this is real. That God actually really does change a believer. And, and we talked about in the beginning, visible miracles in their life. People that, and you know some of them, like maybe it's not you, maybe you haven't gone through it, some people have been through that people, but people that have been totally changed from horrible lifestyles, and now they're like a totally different person. Like that's our most obvious example, right? And you can't believe some of the goodness that they're involved with. What is that? That's a supernatural miracle. That's God changing somebody's heart from the inside out. That's what God does when he gives somebody faith. Think about how foolish it is to say that any gift from God would come back empty or not change someone. It's ridiculous when you consider God's power. So when a person confesses, confesses their guilt and sinfulness before God, there's a healthy fear of their creator that's present. And I believe that the Spirit's been emphasizing this with us for many reasons for some time now. Only God knows. Listen very carefully, especially if you think you already know what we're talking about and you think it's too much repetition. Only God knows what He's working out in each of our souls right now. The garbage He's working out in our souls right now. And in the local community we come in contact with that maybe needs to hear it. This type of truth. This type of good news that God's salvation is never in vain. It always produces goodness. Maybe that's what our, our area needs to hear. Maybe that's part of it. But only God knows what he's working out in each of our souls. Let him do his work. Stay humble. Keep taking it in. Realize you don't know it all. Let him do his work in you. Otherwise, you're going to block his work in you. And you're going to have to hear this again for another two years. Ha! That'd be funny. No, it wouldn't, right? Uh, so, another visible result of saving faith. The genuine believer also has the love of God at least to some degree in his life. Love is a sign that the light of the Lord exists in a person. Again, it's one of those inescapable changes that takes place in the life of a believer. 
You can see this if you read 1 John chapters 3 and 4, and 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, and the Gospels. Just how Jesus said, uh, you'll know, you know, know my disciples by their love for one another. Does our flesh get in the way at times in our lives? Absolutely. It happens, and thank God he understands when it happens. But, again, the genuine believer will have the love of God, at least to some degree in his life. That's a sign that Jesus is now living in this person. The true believer has the love of God in his heart, and what's in the heart comes out of the mouth according to Jesus, and even in their lifestyle. As in Matthew 7, Jesus said, we will know them by their fruits. Turn to 1 John 3, 14. 1 John 3, 14. I'm going to spend a little time now in 1 John, which is very straightforward for us on many of these topics. I mean, and if you want to see for yourself... If what we're talking about is true, go home and read 1 John, just the letter of 1 John in entirety. I think it's only five chapters. Just go read it in context. See what John is saying as a friend. See what John is saying. He's telling the truth in love. Go read it. So 1 John 3.14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. How do we know we're saved? Because we love the brethren. We have some love for the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? How do we know that we pass out of life into death? How do we know that we're saved? How do we know that we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, as in Colossians 1? How do we know? Because... We love the brethren. If you have no love for the brethren, that's a sign that something might be wrong with your faith. Not your works. Don't start forcing loving people just in case to cover your butt. There's a problem with the core. There's a problem with the root of the tree, the faith. The heart's surrender to God. That's where the problem is. So if you need to, you go back to God and do it. But again, we know we passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Read those chapters in context. And John says the one who doesn't love is not a believer. If you read 1 John. Another visible result of saving faith, the genuine believer will live in righteousness, at least to some degree. Also stated clearly in 1 John 3 and 4. Did you ever have a business decision to make and your conscience is bothering you that you might not be doing the right thing or you might be you know skirting the edges of righteousness it's a good sign if your conscience is bothering you because that means the spirit is working in you but if, if your conscience doesn't bother you and you cheat people all the time you might have a bigger problem in your soul the genuine believer will live in righteousness at least to some degree as clearly stated in 1 John 3 and 4. The believer has a lifestyle of doing the right thing because God's law is now written on his heart, according to the scriptures. The obedience of faith is a beautiful thing to behold in another person, isn't it? In another believer, when you see someone living in the obedience of the faith, it's like, it's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it, and it's beautiful. And it's because it reveals a heart that has lovingly surrendered to Christ and the believer honors him. You see that honoring going on in their life. On the board, the fruit of righteousness is a beautiful, eye-catching thing to behold in this corrupt world. That's our light that shines, by the way. That's what people will see. And more and more as the world gets worse, they're going to see this light shining bright out of you. And they're like, what is that? Why are you doing the right thing here? Everybody cheats in that area. It's not a big deal. Why are you doing the right thing here? There's a fruit of righteousness that comes in the believer's life. And it's, it's very eye-catching. 
and it's evident in the lives of true believers. Turn to 1 John 2.29. 1 John 2.29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. How do we know you're, you're born again? How do you know you're born again? Because you practice righteousness. You actually try to do the right thing. Your conscience actually bothers you when you don't. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Look at 1 John 3, verse 7. 1 John 3, verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. I hope you see this is not saying what a good believer looks like and what a bad believer looks like. Look what it says. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about being a, ch a child of God or a child of the devil. We're not talking about sitting in between, right? And the sign, or one of the signs, which is quote-unquote obvious, is if someone does not practice righteousness and they do not love their brother, they are not of God. That's how you know. You will know them by their fruit. This isn't rocket science. This is something children can see and do see more than adults. So the point the Spirit is making on the board, characteristics such as fear of God, obedience, righteousness, and love are products of genuine saving faith. It's seamless as from the same piece of cloth. In other words, this is what faith looks like. This is what faith produces because it's a perfect gift from God. I think of our Lord's seamless garment when he was at the cross. I share this with the Bible students too in India. In John 19, it says the Lord's garment was seamless. And the soldiers, they were dividing up his garments among themselves. And they didn't want to ruin it by dividing it up. So instead they cast lots for it. How appropriate is it that our Lord had a seamless garment? Think about what that is a picture of. A garment without any division or inconsistency. I think this is a picture of his salvation and sanctification. As the Spirit's been showing us. They're one continuum. They're seamless, really. There's no discrepancy with Jesus' gospel of salvation or the results that come from it. And he was the perfect, literally, the perfect example of that. On the board, Jesus Christ is the only perfectly seamless person who ever lived. His words and actions were seamless always without any contradiction whatsoever. John 19, 23. He is pure consistency. 100% consistent. He never said something he didn't mean. He never did something contrary to what he said. Again, Jesus is the only perfectly seamless person who ever lived. His words and his actions were seamless always without any contradiction whatsoever. That's why he's our great example, our prototype, tempted in every area yet without sin. And so, what does that mean to us? The faith and the life of his believers are consistent as far as the new creature goes. The faith, like saving faith, and the life 
like sanctification, they're consistent. As far as the new creature goes anyway. We muck it up sometimes, but if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you now have a new life that sprouts forth fruit, according to the Bible. Good fruit. Perfectly as far as the new creature goes. These are seamless things. These are visible results of saving faith. So as we begin to close, some of the quickest, most visible fruit to sprout in a believer's life is seen in the life or in the saving of a man named Zacchaeus. Many of you know his wonderful story. He's a great example of the visible results of saving faith. He climbed a tree so he could see Jesus coming by. And when Jesus called to him, he basically melted. He surrendered to him as Lord, God, and Savior. And to his righteousness, too. He received a changed heart, and his life revealed it. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 19, verse 8, for a quick recap of this. Luke 19, verse 8. The fruit of this man's faith was quickly seen in his willingness to give away his belongings, to bring right to those he wronged, and to serve the Lord. He was given a good conscience by the Spirit of Christ. He was given a good conscience, which Timothy talks about. Look at Luke 19, 8. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. He didn't say, What a good believer. He didn't say, Nice job because you're sanctifying yourself or something like that. He said, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's like, this man's been found. How do I know? Look at his heart. Look at his attitude. Look at his good conscience coming forward. He received the Lord. The Lord changed him. What did the Lord say to Zacchaeus? Today salvation has come to this house, for he too is a son of Abraham. And that's a picture, my friends, of the wonderful results of saving faith by the grace and power of God that enters into a believer's heart when he surrenders in faith. And Abraham, the father of our faith, he was known for his works that were evidence of his faith. Abraham was famous in Hebrews chapter 11 that his works were evidence of his faith. He was famous for his works. Where did they come from? Someone who really surrendered to God in humility that said, you're my Lord and my Savior, I need you. And the works are a sign of saving faith. So said Jesus right here. And remember, the Lord would challenge people. If they claim to have Abraham's faith, if they claim to be of God, he would challenge people. How did he challenge people? How did he challenge their faith? Look what he said on the board here. To those who claim to be of God, the Lord told them, then do the deeds of Abraham. John 8, 39. You say you're of God, you say Abraham is your father, then why don't you do the deeds of Abraham? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Different verse, right? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? Is something wrong with your faith? Is something wrong with the roots of the tree? You're being religious, but you haven't surrendered to me? Maybe. So in other words, there's unavoidable proof of someone who has repented toward God. A man cannot truly believe in Christ and not be changed in some way. And you just got to read your Bibles in context to see it. You know, stop chopping up the Bible. Stop going to your favorite verses only and leaving out half of the message. Read your Bibles in context. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you stuff and let Him convict you. Because this is what the Bible says as a whole. The plenary scripture, right? As a whole. It's like this is undeniable stuff. So on the board, 
even if a true believer doesn't yet realize the importance and the power of the Word of God, God's law is now on the heart of the person who turned to Christ in humility. Ezekiel 36, 26. God gives a new heart. Just as it was written on the hearts of the Gentiles who didn't even know the law in Romans 2, 15. So you might come across a believer out there and you can tell they're a believer because of their attitude about Christ. They have a relationship. They have a surrendered attitude. They appreciate what he did for them. That's how you can, you can see the fruit of a believer, even if they might not even know the Bible's the Word of God yet. They may not understand yet. Everyone's at different places, right? But how do you know? Because somebody's got a changed heart and therefore a changed attitude about the Lord. So I'm going to close in two more minutes here with this. I've met some beautiful believers out there in my day-to-day travels, as I'm sure you have, who do not regularly study the Word of God. How is that? Like, how is that possible, right? Because they had a coming to Jesus moment, if you will. They had sincere faith in Christ. And there was a heart change. And their life reflects their love for Him. Should they get into the Word of God? Yeah, they should, once they, you know, realize what it is. And if they're humble, the Spirit's going to convict them. But they, t- time for everything, right? How is it there are beautiful believers out there that have a love for Christ that don't understand or appreciate the Word of God yet because they really surrender to Him in faith, in humility? There's a certain righteousness that appears in their life, but a lifestyle of unrighteousness reveals that maybe they weren't saved to begin with. Maybe they never did have trusting faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and they're possibly playing a religious game with God. I think of people that I know from a certain large Christian religion in our area. Some of them have a fear of God. Some really do, even though they may not be into His Word yet. And they have God's love and live in His righteousness to some degree. The faith of a child can see this simple evidence of genuine saving faith in Christ. It can witness the signs in the life of a true believer whose heart has been changed. The faith of a child can see it. If we get out of our own way. But then I know others in that same big religion that are in that religion, but to them it seems to be a ritual just the right thing to do, kind of covering their butt. But they have no love and live however they want. Sometimes boasting in unrighteousness. So we'll close with this on the board. Regarding the visible results of saving faith that we've talked about, these are signs that even a child can recognize, and it's not supposed to be difficult to see. Jesus said, It's as simple as seeing good or bad fruit on a tree in Matthew 7. And John elaborated on on that in 1 John 3. These are signs that even a child can recognize. It's as simple as seeing good or bad fruit on a tree. Now again, we're not called to judge others. But we are called to be on guard and to discern false prophets. To be able to discern those that might even be trying to deceive us, willfully or unwillfully, knowingly or unknowingly, to be able to discern those that are not of the fold so that we're not deceived by false doctrine. So there's an inescapable change in the life of a person who has come to saving faith in the Lord. There's a change of heart that will be evident and there's a certain level of humility that will appear. I hope, you, I hope you see that, and I hope for, for me it's, it's dis- described in my own soul, I guess, as a change in attitude. What's somebody's attitude towards the Lord, for example? What's somebody's attitude towards fellow believers? What's somebody's attitude towards their church? And if you don't see any reverence, any fear of God, for example, any love for one another, there's a problem with the root of the tree. 
they may not be what the Bible would call genuine saving faith, you know. But what, what, it, what it shows for what that is, is an attitude, a repentant attitude, you might call it, a humble attitude, an attitude of thanksgiving towards God, that he saved a wretch like me. Those are some of the visible signs of saving faith. And apparently, this is what God wants us to know really well, not only, only for ourselves, but to share with those around us that might be living in deception. Amen? All right, let's bow. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word, the truth that sets us free, Father. This is all part of the good news. We thank you for your spirit who teaches us these things and helps us understand these things. And we ask for your help in sharing these things with those that are lost, Father, that might need to hear these things. Help us share the truth in love as you tell us to do. We thank you that Jesus said that his sheep not only hear his voice, but will follow him. And that that's a truth, that's a changed life that is part of the good news of saving faith. Your word never comes back empty, Father. We're grateful and thankful for your power and your grace in our lives. We ask that you bless us all as we leave. We ask these things in Christ's precious name, by the power of your Holy Spirit.